Good morning. Welcome everyone to our worship service this morning. This is the first Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, the Epiphany season began uh, on January 6th. The, the Christmas season goes from January 20th, or December 25th to January 5th, the 12 days of Christmas. And uh, at the, the beginning of Epiphany, we always focus on the, the, the gifts of the wise men. And now the first Sunday after Epiphany is always a time to focus on the baptism of Jesus. And as we look at Jesus' baptism, at the beginning of his reign as a Messiah, we also recognize and look at our own baptisms and how it gives us a new beginning each time we remember them. Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from the book of Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle is taken from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, the sixth chapter. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we could no longer be enslaved to sin. For who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the gospel and the singing of the triple alleluia. Alleluia. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Alleluia. St. Mark in the first chapter. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. As a 
further remembrance of what bas baptism is about, its essence, its power, and its purpose, I invite you to turn with me to page 325 in the front part of your hymnal. There we will speak the responses that Luther, Martin Luther had written in reference to what the Bible says about baptism. And all of this is from his small catechism. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And which is that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore all and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. And which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will believe in him. Well, how can water do such great things? Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism, that is, a life-giving water, rich in grace and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, He saved us through the washing of the earth and renewal of our Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And what does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old habit in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where is this written? St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You may be seated for the hymn of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, those words in the name of the triune God, spoken over us in our baptism are a constant reminder of, of what we received at that time. That's what it's intended to be. We're talking a lot about baptism, I know, in our service today. You know, it wasn't that many years ago, really, um, a frequent visitor to our services, whose husband was a member, but she was not a member, used to challenge me with all kinds of questions. This was the lady who would, would ask me uh, sometimes, why um, we don't have an altar call in our services. And oftentimes I would think about that and, and, and I would answer, well, we have an altar call. We have an altar call every service, every Sunday. It's at the beginning of the service, not at the end of the service. And it's not just for the unbelievers, but for believers as well. And I could have made a connection with baptism. She would say to me, why do you preach such short sermons? And I would always chuckle and think, you're the only one that's ever said that to me. <laughs> and, and, and I would say, our whole service is a sermon from start to finish. And, and, and really, in essence, it's a story that encompasses what we receive in our baptisms. Now, I didn't say that. Because another question that she asked me, she says, why do you Lutherans 
talk so much about baptism and make such a big deal about baptism. So I could have answered all of those questions as well by making this baptismal connection for her. There are a lot of ways that we could answer that question. And maybe sometimes uh, you have been asked the same question, although I suspect not, because in our churches these days, even in our Lutheran churches, there's, it's kind of receded. We don't talk about baptism nearly enough. There's a lot of answers that we could give to that question. Why do Lutherans make such a big deal about baptism? But really, in essence, first and foremost, the reason we as Lutherans make such a big deal about baptism is because the Bible makes a big deal about baptism. From the very first chapter of Genesis to the very last chapter of Revelation, there are, are countless connections and allusions that are made to baptism. Today we heard a couple of them that probably most of us were not aware of. Because when we baptize, what do we do? We apply water. And we give a candle. And that candle is a reminder that Jesus is the light of the world, the light of light. John talks about that in John chapter 1. But John also talks about that in Revelation chapter 22. And we look back to the very beginning of creation before the first day was declared and see that there was this watery mass and that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. A little clue about baptism that would be spoken of later on. And when, the, when God created and, and, and brought the dry land and all of the animals and all of the, the, um, the plants and, and all of that that would live on this land and in these seas and then formed the man from, from the dust and then, and then brought Adam from his rib, all of those things happened and when they came out they were pristine, they were clean because they began in the pure waters and the Holy Spirit was hovering over them. And then God declared, let there be light. Sometimes people will say, you know, where we see the Spirit in, in these opening verses of Genesis. We hear the Father, the Creator, speak these things into existence. Where is Jesus? And, and a good answer for that is, Jesus is that light. When, when, when he says, let there be light, and there was no sun, moon, or stars until the fourth day, then Jesus would have been that light. We learn it in John chapter 1 that Jesus is the light of the world. John is pointing back to the creation when he says, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was God. And then later on in, in, in that same chapter, it speaks about Jesus as the light. Then we go to Revelation, also written by John, chapter 22. And it speaks about the fact that the church will no longer need the sun, moon, or stars because Jesus will be our light. And then the Holy Spirit encourages us and calls us to receive the water of life. And when we hear about the water of life, we immediately, as God's children, who have looked at the scriptures are going to be thinking about baptism. And that this new creation that emerges then would be a, a recreation, but it will be an eternal cleansing that happened to us as we res continually receive the, the, the waters of life, no longer sinning, no longer needing that. What is it that comes from that will be clean and pristine. In the meantime, there are all kinds of connections that we can find in regard to baptism. The one that happens next is the story of Noah. When God, after the fall, saw the sinfulness of the, the mankind that is created, and then he decided, well, I'm going to start this again, and then uh, covers the land with this water, and then saves with the ark, Noah, his three sons, and their four wives, we can see a picture of what baptism is about. And, and not only do we see it, you know, and, and we're not just stretching in order to make that happen, but we read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, where Peter makes that connection clearly for us, saying this that happened to Noah 
is a picture of baptism. This really happened, but it also is portraying something to us. And then he says, this baptism now saves you. That is as clear a language as we possibly could receive. It's not long after that we learn about, in, in, the, in Genesis, we learn about Abraham and how uh, Abram, God um, instituted a rite of circumcision for the, the young boys who would be the offspring of, uh, in Abraham's line, in Abram's line. Well, we look in Colossians chapter 2, where St. Paul says is that we are circumcised with a, word, a circumcision that is not made with hands. And it's not just for young boys. It's a circumcision for all peoples of all ages, of all genders, uh, both genders. This is saying that baptism, in verse 12, has taken the place of circumcision for us. Sometimes people will say, well, why wasn't Jesus baptized as a little baby? Well, he was circumcised as a little baby, and then once he began his messianic rule, that's when he instituted baptism for us. And when he said in his last words in Matthew chapter 28, his last words before he is received into heaven and ascended into heaven, he says to the people, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he tells us, how do we do that? By baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them. And so that's why we as a church will baptize um, our children and then continue to teach them just as Jesus had prescribed for us. And that's what confirmation is all about. The words that you spoke as a, a renewal of baptismal vows and, and a, re a remembrance of the promises basically was taken right from the confirmation right. Luther in his flood prayer, his baptismal prayer, does focus on Noah and, and, and this connection with baptism. He also connects Moses taking the children of Israel across the Red Sea to baptism too. And how the I Egyptians were drowned, but then God's people emerged alive with a new beginning. That's what baptism does for us. And so there are all these pictures in the Old Testament, very clear, very important pictures. But the most, I think one of the clearest is, is what we heard today in, in Mark chapter 1. When it says that all these people were coming for a baptism from John that was a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. It was a baptism of repentance. And even though Jesus was without sin, and, and John recognizes that, and when he sees Jesus come to him to be baptized, he says, I should not be baptizing you. You don't need it. I need to be baptized by you. Jesus says, let it be done to fulfill all righteousness. And so what Jesus was doing is he's preparing the waters for in the future when we connect that water with the word. And when Jesus did institute baptism in, the, in his last words before he was ascended into heaven in Matthew 28 and in Mark 16, the final verses of Mark, where he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved who believes not, will be condemned. And so if, if Jesus is going to make that kind of a connection about baptism, and Mark is going to record that, and Matthew is going to record it. Now we keep in mind, Mark learns his stuff from Peter, and Peter is the one who says that in 1 Peter 3, baptism now saves you. Peter is the one who on Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit had come on the people, and the people uh, were hearing the gospel message of what Jesus had accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection in their own languages, and then when Peter stands up and says, uh, indicts them for being responsible for, for killing the Messiah, the Christ. And they're cut to the heart and they say, what must we do? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So the reason that we make such a big deal out of baptism is because the Bible makes a big deal out of baptism. It's throughout the scriptures. Now for some of us, that's enough. The Bible says it, I believe it. That settles it. And for some of us, we need more. 
There are plenty of mysteries in the scriptures that we have trouble grasping and, 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 and even trusting and, and have our doubts about them because we don't understand how it is or we don't understand why it is. And there are a number of those things where, where God remains and keeps those things close to us and just says, you need to trust in me, trust in my word and my promises. Baptism is not one of those things. Because in baptism, God has revealed some of the reasons for doing that. It, it, it pictures for us this wonderful gift of grace and, and, and talks about this idea of grace. It's not a work that we are doing to show God how much we love God. This is God's work because our work will never save us, but this is saying baptism saves you. The only thing that can save us is God's work. And because Jesus suffered and died on the cross and then won that forgiveness for us. Now he wants to get the forgiveness to us. And one of the means that he uses to do that is our baptisms. Now certainly people can hear the word and hear that gospel message and come to faith having not been baptized. But then sometime thereafter, after being instructed, we do. Because this is what Christ has commanded us to do and out of love and obedience and trust in Christ. If Jesus says it, then that, that's enough for us. We believe it. We trust it. But there are some very, very important and practical purposes in understanding what ha is happening at baptism. It's, it's, it's a wonderful picture of God's grace, of God working in our lives. But there is a, a very important purpose and reason for remembering our baptisms, and we do it every time we can ask God for forgiveness. Because what happens is, is when God baptized, when you're baptized in God's name, we are receiving the forgiveness of sins for our sins we committed beforehand, for that original sin that is a part of all of us, and also for the sins that we're going to commit tomorrow and in the future. They have been forgiven for us in our baptisms. And unfortunately, when we look around and see people who were absent, people who have been baptized at this altar and at this font, oftentimes that means that they are not receiving the benefits of their baptism any longer. They're not receiving that forgiveness because they're not recognizing their need for God's forgiveness. They're not recognizing their sin. They're not asking for forgiveness. Whether that be in a daily way or in coming to worship here and receiving that forgiveness when we confess our sins. That's why we confess our sins. That's the connection. And that's why it, it happens right at the beginning of the service. We begin in the name of the triune God and then we confess our sins because this is what God has instituted for us. There's a very important reason for that. And we read about it in Romans chapter 6. Luther talks about it this way. He, he cites a proverb that says, worse and worse, the longer a vice lasts, the worse it gets. And I think every one of us here can agree with that. We know what that, what, what that proverb's talking about. If there's something that you are doing as a, as a sinful human being, and every time you indulge that same sin again and again and again, it gets a stronger, tighter grip on your life. The longer we let that live, the longer we let it continue, the worse it's going to get. Luther says, you know, with those little babies, they don't have those kinds of vices. But as they grow older, they do, and, they, and it just gets stronger and stronger in their lives. Something has to stop it. Something has to put that vice to death, and it's baptism. This is what he's saying when he says in Romans chapter 6, we brown that old man. And when that old man, that sinful nature, is drowned and dies, then what emerges is a new man who arises and comes forth. And so that's not an old sin that continues to have that constant grip. Yes, we will sin again. And yes, we will need to ask for God's forgiveness again. But in a very practical way, a very important way, if you want to deal with your sin and your life in a God-pleasing way, as soon as those thoughts, as soon as those actions come into our lives, that is the time to ask for forgiveness and to remember I am a Christian. I am baptized. I have received God's forgiveness. And it puts that, that old Adam to death. The new man arises. You get a new start. 
and a new beginning. And this cycle goes over and over again. It is the best way for us to live our lives and to prepare what will happen in the future when we are finally received into heaven to receive that living water for eternity. And so ultimately, when I think about it, the question that we sometimes get asked, that we might ask ourselves, why do Lutherans make such a big deal out of baptism? Because the Bible makes such a big deal out of baptism. And we can turn that around and think, well, why don't we make more of our baptisms? Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Psalm 51 that we sing um, oftentimes on Sundays, the create in me a clean heart, is a wonderful picture of what happens to us in our baptisms. We rise to sing now. So what a perfect hymn for, a uh, wonderful hymn for including, including this service, but also really any of our services. So I, th I think we're going to sing that one more often. That was a kind of a new discovery for me. What a great hymn. Um, we've got a, a several announcements to make, and I'm going to um, first invite our thriving advocates. Um, Matt uh, has announced before us. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, we appreciate that. And that goodwill offering uh, will be helping to replenish our social concerns fund. So we really appreciate um, the, the work that our, our thriving advocates have put into this event. And we, we, we want to, you know, encourage that and also participate and support that. So I hope that people can sign up and be there. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a great time and also for a good cause. Um, tomorrow night is... Our, our voters meeting and oftentimes January voters meetings may seem may not seem like they have much um, for to draw us but tomorrow night we're gonna have some important discussions on the one hand we'll get a chance to hear a report of our year-end uh, financials that I think is is uh, once again very important and also a, a good sign of God blessing us as a congregation and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious for folks to, to hear about that but then also we're going to, there's two topics we're going to be talking about. One is our relationship as a, as a church and a congregation with our Lutheran High School Association and our support of that and, and, and you know, how we want to be a part of that support, how we, we fit into that, um, and, and whether that means continued support, you know, and those kinds of questions. It's an important question that people are wanting to get some feedback on. The other one is, um, many of you know that we had, had stopped um, renting our, our, so our building for things like um, uh, marriage, uh, wedding receptions and things like that for 2015. We were honoring those um, events that we had already scheduled, but we were not taking any new ones on. And while well, it's been really hard, there's a number of people in the congregation, the community that were just, you know, broken hearted over that. And, and so we're, we're continuing the discussions and looking at ways that possibly we could um, do something about that. 
we'll see uh, in that. But we're going to have that discussion tomorrow night. Our Board of Facilities use will listen to the input and then our, likewise the council and, and see where that takes us. So um, if you want to kind of weigh in on those things, uh, we encourage you to be there. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? All right, well, we are so grateful that you could be here for this Epiphany uh, service and pray that you will continue to do so, that this will be a part of your New Year's resolution to be in worship often, and also to notice the people who are not here, to invite them, to encourage them. Um, we want those folks to be receiving the benefits of their baptisms as well. Thank you. God's peace be with you. Please take time to extend God's peace to one another.